Well, welcome to today's webinar on how your practice can survive and thrive through COVID-19. I know many of you are um, working some longer hours, maybe shorter hours, and while you're trying to help a lot of your patients, there also is an impact to the health of your practice. So what we're going to focus today on is really business strategies to help you through that rebound and recovery process and some, some things that you can do immediately right now today to get going on that path to recovery. This is Wendy Myers with Communication Solutions for Veterinarians and for more than 20 years I've been teaching veterinary teams how to improve their communication skills so that as a result more pets get the medical care that they need and you also grow your hospital's revenue. I offer monthly CE credit webinars. They're always live on the third Thursday of every month and always recorded as well, so that way you get 24-7 access to classes. I have been a partner in a specialty and emergency practice for uh, five years, uh, helping with some of the marketing and staff training of that practice. We did sell it to a corporate group a few years ago. I love to write. Um, I have published five books and also have a now 10-year running column in Veterinary Practice News Magazine, so if you love what you hear today, uh, look on the Veterinary Practice News website as well as mine, csvets.com, because I uh, frequently uh, post blogs there as well. And then lastly, I'm a proud member of the American Animal Hospital Association and appreciate all of the resources and support that they're also providing for hospitals during this pandemic. So here's what we're going to cover in the 45 minutes that we're going to be together today. And I will take questions at the end of the live session as well. So we're going to look at how do you communicate with clients during a crisis. And I'm going to give you a lot of the different tools that you already have that you can put into play to keep those client ties strong because you do want people to come back and return to your practice when the pandemic is over. No, I know that many of you now are doing curbside services and we'll look at ways to show value and really open communication for clients, even though they may not be physically present in the exam room with you as care is delivered. We also will look at the like business critical need for an online store today because people just can't pop into your practice after work. You know, many of them are working from home. Um, the county where I am is actually on lockdown and we're not supposed to leave except for, you know, medical appointments or to go to the grocery store or to the bank. Um, so there's a lot of limited activity these days. We also will look at telemedicine as a way that you can keep that social distancing and yet still be there to serve clients. And then some of us are working from home right now, and I want to show you duties that I'm going to go through for managers, client service team, and the medical team, actual work that you could do from home, because my goal is to keep everybody employed and also keep revenue coming in for the practice. We also will look at how you can utilize forward booking to transition because um, I would hope and pray that in a month or two that we're all going to be back to normal and uh, as, as normal, probably newly defined, to seeing patients and uh, I'll show you how you can set yourself up for success today through forward booking. And then lastly, I'll share an informational slide with you. And all of those links are also um, in the helpful web links box for those of you that are participating live. And this will show you some tools and resources that you can use for your practice. So before we go into all those strategies, there's one important first step that you need to take. And that is to help your employees get to work. Um, I shared with you that the county where I live in Colorado is on lockdown. And we're um, not supposed to leave our homes except for essential travel. Well, the American Veterinary Medical Association has um, urged veterinary hospitals to be classified as essential businesses, just like a grocery store or a human hospital. And it does vary by state. There's not a federal mandate. So I'm going to tell you that if in your state, if a veterinary hospital has been declared an essential business, and I know we have many practices also joining us from Canada, so if in your province you've been declared an essential business, you need to give employees the tools to be able to get to work. And I want to share two examples with you. The first that you see on the left is a template, and that is one of the files available for download. And I also have the, the link here on the slide, and I have it again in the presentation on my helpful web links towards the end. 
But this is a template from the American Veterinary Medical Association. And you'll want to create a letter for each of your employees that's printed on hospital letterhead that clearly explains that they are an essential employee and they need to have this physically with them at all times. Because if they are driving from their home to your veterinary hospital and get pulled over by a police officer, they need to be able to say, look, hey, I'm on my way to work and, and here's proof. The second thing, and I want to give a shout out to Joshua Jasper, who's the hospital director at Capital Area Emergency and Specialty. He actually created for all of his employees, and I, I've seen several examples of this, of hospital managers sharing these ideas on Facebook, that every employee um, has their picture on a laminated badge that they wear as a lanyard, or this is something they could tuck in their wallet. So as they're traveling from work to home and back, um, they're able to have that identification as well, and it has a photograph on there. So I actually would encourage you to do both of these, the letter that the employee is going to carry, and then also an ID badge. So let's get into our strategies. The first one is to communicate, communicate, communicate. You really want, through a crisis, to communicate often and in multiple channels with your clients. They need to know if your business is open or closed and what are those hours. Many of you have probably had some changes in your hospital hours. I know that some practices um, are, have actually closed that previously maybe saw patients on Saturdays and they're not seeing patients now on Saturdays. Um, Monday through Friday, more business hours, you know, eight to five, because many people are working from home. And if there is an urgent or emergency situation, they're more likely to be able to get to your practice during that time as well. So I want you to think about on your hospital's website and right on the home page, you know, have a pop-up window that's going to share what are your COVID protocols for the safety of not only your staff, but for clients as well as their pets. I also would love for you to write blogs about uh, ways to, to stay safe and, and when to know is your pet experiencing an illness or an injury, when to know to come to the vet, you know, what can wait, what can't wait. And I think you need to really clearly define that for your clients. And you could do that through websites and your blog. Social media, I'm going to share quite a few examples with you today in the presentation. And I want to make sure that you're posting literally daily on social media updates for your clients so they know what's happening and can continue to stay in touch with you. I'm also going to show you some examples next of parking lot and yard signage because when clients pull into your parking lot, they need to know what are the safety steps they need to take in order to interact with you in appropriate social distancing methods. You also will want to send an email to your entire client database. Um, I will tell you two weeks ago, I got an email from my veterinarian explaining that what their reduced hours were going to be, that they were only seeing urgent and emergency care, that they were going to be rescheduling any dental procedures and elective procedures for an, another month uh, to kind of get through this crisis and also to preserve their personal protective equipment. And I think you just want to be very clear with clients uh, about that and share that information as situations change you also may have a texting service for your practice, and that's a, also a quick, efficient way to reach everyone. You know, texts have a 99% open rate compared to only 33% for healthcare emails. So texting is going to almost be guaranteed that every client's going to see that message, and you could even include in that text a link to your practice website where they can read in greater detail what your COVID protocols are. Some of you may have an app for your practice, and that also can send out push notifications to your clients whenever there is a change in hours or in how they get refills on medications and diets. And then your on-hold message, you know, when clients are calling to, to schedule maybe that sick pet appointment that is more urgent, um, there is, you know, a chance that they may be placed on hold. In fact, the research shows 70% of phone calls to your practice do get put on hold. Uh, average hold time is just under two minutes, so it is brief. But while your client is waiting, they can be listening to educational messages. And I would front load any 
coronavirus messaging right at the very beginning when that hold button gets pushed. So let's look at some examples. Um, the first one I'm going to share with you is from True Companion Veterinary Care. They're in Cypress, Texas, and they shared on uh, Facebook uh, the picture from their front door, and they actually wrote a letter to clients, and this letter uh, can be taped to the front door and because the front door is locked, so people need to know what's the protocol for how we're going to serve you. Uh, we don't want people just coming into the lobby and then there's gatherings and, and potential spread of coronavirus. So the letter taped right on the front door clearly explains here's what the protocol is and you'll see the phone number is in big bold type right there. This same client letter can also be the text that's part of your email blast that you send out to all of your clients. And then here they also shared it on social media. So you can take something you wrote once and use it in multiple channels. I want you to also think because social media is a way that many of us are staying in touch through this crisis with you know friends, family, and the businesses that we support. And at River Red Veterinary Hospital in New Orleans, they actually updated their cover photo on Facebook. And I like what they've done here because they're explaining that they're open for curbside service only and what to do when you arrive. And it's done in a very positive, proactive way. I also want you to post daily on social media. And your practice may be doing um, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, wherever you are participating, do update people whenever you have new information or a change and also share with them resources. And I am going to share with you several websites at the end of today's presentation that are great trusted resources from both AHA and ABMA that you can also share with your clients. The example here that I love is from Plymouth Veterinary Hospital in Michigan and they actually uh, posted, um, they've got quite a bit on, on their Facebook page, but this was a, a nice tip on five ways to prepare your pets from, for quarantine. Because while all of us are, are stuck at home, we need to make sure we don't run out of medication or run out of food. And then there's some additional tips that they've shared in that post. So what should you share on social media? Let me give you a couple of content examples. So I want you to really hit hard the message of how the concierge curbside service works because the more people know up front, the more smooth that process and experience is going to be for them. I also like for you to be very transparent and even do a little short video of here's how we care for your pet while you're out waiting in your car. How do you sterilize your exam rooms and how do you make sure that we are limiting contact and also doing the best to preserve a nice, sterile hospital environment. I would love for you to tell pet owners when, what symptoms should you like get to the vet? When should I seek medical care? If you are offering new services, such as telemedicine or your online store, make sure that you're also communicating how to access those services through your social media post. And then, as, as I think a, an important one is people still want to see you and see the compassion and the kindness. Um, I've seen lots of great Facebook posts from, from clinic staff of them providing loving care for pets without owners present. I've seen silly pictures of technicians with cones on, on their uh, head as a way to say, look, we're, we're uh, you know, stopping the spread of the disease. And it's silly and it's fun, but people realize that you still have a, a sense of humor and that you're still there for them and their pets. Now, a couple of uh, phrases to avoid as you're talking to clients about how you're going to be delivering care um, without them being present. So initially, when many of us went to uh, curbside services, I heard a, a lot of people calling it a drop-off. And I think drop-off has a very negative perception and feel. So instead of the word drop-off, I want you to use curbside concierge or valet vet. And those are some more positive phrases that are going to help people understand the process. I also want you to avoid the phrase in the back. We're going to take your pet in the back. In the back is the scary torture chamber to the client. They're not allowed to go in to that area. 
So instead of in the back, I want you to call it a treatment area. This is a much more professional term and really accurately describes what that is in your facility. I also want you to banish the word estimate. Estimate really centers that conversation on money. And instead, to focus it on medical care, I want you to use either the phrase treatment plan or treatment solution. So next, let's look at how do we show value for the curbside concierge service? Because clients are not physically with you in that exam room. So when clients call to come in for a sick pet appointment or for urgent care or if there's been an injury, I literally want the client care team to explain to them what is the process. And you're going to do this in the scheduling call. You're going to let them know that they're not going to be coming into the hospital, that they're just going to wait in their car, that they need to call you upon arrival. And this is kind of the first introduction to this process. Remember, we looked at earlier that letter that's going to be taped to the front door. But during the scheduling call, because many of these may be same day appointments as well, you're training them what the process is going to be. So step one is call us. Step two is that a nurse is going to talk with you about your pet's services and explain what care we will deliver while you wait in your car. A doctor also will call you on your cell to explain exam findings and any treatments or medications that are needed. We also will call you, so you can see there's probably like two or three phone calls here, to go over the fees and get your consent over the phone and also collect payment over the phone. And I always close with a statement of appreciation. You know, we appreciate the opportunity to care for your pet and really help everybody have a safe environment. So set up that initial expectation right from the beginning of that phone call. Now I want to share some examples with you of what to set the expectation when clients pull into your parking lot. And I put some numbers on these red arrows for you. So the first one that you'll see here is from Tip City Veterinary Hospital in Ohio. And they actually um, have done two really smart things. They've made some little yard signs and just put those in the, in the landscaping. And in very large print, you know, stay in your vehicle and call this number for instructions. And then they have a second sign that explains what that curbside concierge service involves. You also notice where I have the red arrow with the number two on it. They have put cones in front of their door. And that kind of, through just a, a look, a example communicates to clients you can't come in here that this is a restricted area. But the cones also are far enough apart that as staff come and go with patients, they're able to get in and out of that front door as, as they need access. And then a really smart idea from a practice in Wisconsin is they actually um, created some little yard stakes with numbers. And you'll see that here on the red arrow with the number three on it. And what they did is, is literally label the numbers of the parking spaces. So when the client arrives and calls on the phone, she can say, I'm in parking spot number three, or I'm in parking spot number one. So that way we as staff know which car to go to. And then it's kind of like you have your exam rooms numbered now you're going to have your parking lot spaces numbered, so you also remember the proper vehicle to return that patient to. So when the client has now arrived and, and checked in by phone with the client care team, the next step is for the technician to get the patient. And I want to explain a couple of, of safety protocols for this process. So I like for you, before the technician physically leaves and goes out to the client's car, to have reviewed that pet's medical record in the practice. And so you can see what services are due, what's coming due, what's overdue, what do we need to address today? And also, are there any refills that are needed while she's here today and waiting in the parking lot? So kind of get a good overview. You typically do this anyway before you walk into an exam room, but make sure you do it before you walk outside because you, you don't want to be going back and forth and increasing those um, frequency of contacts. I also would encourage you to actually get the history for the patient over the phone rather than having you come out to my car window and, and we are having an interaction because now we are probably closer than six feet and we're talking and, and there could be a potential that if I would sneeze um, by accident and I don't know that I'm sick, that I'm asymptomatic, that I now have spread it to you. So I usually do the history over the phone 
and make sure that you get all of that information. You also may want to create a history form, or actually, if you have electronic me medical records, just do it. Uh, you know, in the lab pharmacy hallway, and you're going to call the client in or all of that information in the patient's medical record. I like for you to let the client know that a doctor is going to call them to explain exam findings. And again, that is part of that telephone conversation and also what next steps we need to take. Now that you've got everything done over the phone and you've updated that information in the patient's medical record, now it's time to walk to the car. And literally, I want the walk to the car to take like less than a minute and you're gonna get the patient and go right back in the practice, really trying to limit contact um, and closeness to that client who's visiting. Now, when you are doing the exam for the patient, remember the client's sitting out in their car. So I want the doctor to think about what are ways that I can show value to the client. So a couple of choices here. Um, you could actually do the exam and then call the client on her cell phone. You could just use your regular business phone to call her and explain it. If you have um, a practice cell phone or telemedicine or um, the capability uh, to do any kind of a video call like FaceTime, that would be an awesome way for you to be able to actually see each other and explain the findings to the client and, and just talk via FaceTime or through your practice app. Um, the example that I have pictured here is from uh, Southern Veterinary Partners. They um, have over 100 uh, practices across the U.S. and are headquartered out of Birmingham, Alabama. They posted a, a great example from one of their hospital teams where they were um, treating a dog who um, the client was going to have to do some home care with ear cleaning. And so um, they had the client literally get out of his car, come and just watch through the other side of the, the glass front door and we're gonna show you how to do this. And, I, and you can see here, he's got some concern on his face, but this was a safe way to put that glass wall between uh, the technicians and, and the clients. So do get creative, and I think this is a, an, another choice. I also would make sure that you're discussing, um, just as you would in the exam room, what you found, what needs to happen next, are there any treatments or medications that need to go home? And now more than ever, I will tell you that your practice needs to make sure that you've got a YouTube channel and are um, putting up instructional videos for all the things you, you probably used to teach face-to-face -face in the exam room. So how do you clean ears? How do you trim nails? How do you give sub-Q fluids? How do you do all this home care that we used to actually hands-on demonstrate? There now also can be video lessons for that. I like for you to have the doctor, once you've had that conversation, explaining all of the findings and what needs to happen next, to then move on to the next patient. And, and here's an example of what the doctor would say to the client over the phone. Um, the doctor would explain, I'm going to connect you with Sue, and she's going to go all of, over all of the services and fees uh, for today. She's also going to get your consent over the phone for us to go ahead and do that care. And then once we're finished, they will call you to collect payment and then we will email your receipt because I'm also trying to limit the number of physical items that we're passing back and forth. And through your practice management software, you should be able to email the client's receipt. Now, an important tip, when that client makes that initial phone call and says, hey, I'm here, I'm in the parking lot, I'm in space number three, I also would have the receptionist confirm both that client's cell number and email and explain we, I want to make sure I got your right cell number because they, it may be a different number than what we have in our practice management software. I just want to make sure that we have the right email because we're going to be sending by email things like treatment plans and receipts because we don't want to be passing pieces of paper or items that could carry contagion. The next strategy is to make sure that you've got a online store. And um, I have been talking about online stores for several years now as a way to be competitive with internet pharmacies. And now it's a true necessity just for the safety of our staff and our clients. And I'm gonna show you some examples for both delivery of food as well as medications. So I want you to reach out to your veterinary distributor, whoever you buy most of your uh, products and supplies from, and talk with them about your online store. If you don't already have one, they can literally set it up for you within days. And so I don't want you to miss that recurring revenue for refills. 
Um, by the way, pharmacy is 25 to 30 percent of revenue for most practices, and you can't afford to lose 30 percent of your revenue ever, but especially right now for this pandemic. So make sure you take the steps today to start getting that online store up and functioning. I also would encourage you to, when clients call to request refills, um, to prompt them to go into the store and actually set up accounts and explain and talk them through over the phone how to do that. You also could send email blasts to clients with instructions of here's how you set up an account in our online store. You could send a text within a link to maybe instructions on your website. So think of all the different ways. So text, email, app notifications, and, and literally the verbal phone conversations that we have to encourage clients to go there for um, delivery of food and medications. I also want you to set up refill reminders for anything, any product that needs to be purchased again. So diets, preventatives, long-term drugs, and I find that oftentimes what happens is clients are waiting until the last minute, till the last pill is gone to call us for refills, and we may in the future see some shortages in certain medications and I may not be able to get it. I may be out of stock in my practice. It may be on back order from the manufacturer. So I want to really prompt clients ahead of time for refills. And what I advise you to do is actually send the refill reminder one month before that product runs out because that then gives us time to get that shipment in the queue. And sometimes there are also being longer delivery dates because of what's happening and restrictions on travel. And I want to make sure that item is in stock and available. All of the um, pet food companies also have feeding guides where you could actually calculate how long will it take that pet to eat that bag of food or that case of food. And so I would send that refill reminder prior to when they're going to be completely out of food. I also want you to prompt clients to do those refills online. The best number one strategy for you and for your clients is auto shipment. And again, this can apply to preventative, so flea tick and heartworm, diets, and long-term drugs. And besides helping limit the contact that we're going to have with clients by just doing home delivery, it also can significantly improve compliance. The American Animal Hospital Association found that only 55% of dogs are getting year-round heartworm prevention. So that means 45% are unprotected. And I want to make sure that we're using an auto-ship strategy to get more of those patients protected. A study by a veterinary internet pharmacy found that home delivery to clients and preventatives actually had them buying nearly nine doses more per patient. And that is significant revenue for your practice plus it's protecting those pets. So let me give you an example. Let's say that a client today buys six months of a heartworm preventative. I would auto ship the second refill and I would ship that five months from today. So she still has one month at home. So now she's never gonna run out. So a month ahead before that product is gonna be empty, we're gonna auto ship the second one. Now I only auto ship one refill because many of you follow a protocol that that dog needs an annual heartworm test as well as a physical exam before the prescription renewal can happen. So this would just be one auto shipment. A flea and tick product, you could literally auto ship for that dog or cat's life. You also will want to talk with your veterinary distributor about doing single dose shipments every month. And this really helps two types of clients. The first, is multi-pet families. So the client that has six dogs may not be able to afford six 12-packs of both heartworm and flea and tick preventatives all at once. It literally could be financially limiting. And so by getting single doses shipped every month for those six dogs, not only is it more affordable for the client, but we know that there is consistency in dosing and 100% and compliance for all six dogs. It also breaks the bad habit, you and I know this is reality, that oftentimes clients are sharing a box between multiple pets. So that single dosing helps that stop. It also, for clients that are on limited budgets, because 
Um, I would tell you one of our good friends is a server at a restaurant and the restaurant's closed. You know, they're doing takeout only. You don't need a server if it's takeout only service. And so she's out of work. And a lot of people these days, until they can get back to work, may have limited finances. You know, they're dipping into their savings right now. And so doing single doses can actually help them. I want you to also think about promoting your online store if you already have one and, and really kind of um, up that um, effort of promoting the store. And let me give you some examples because I want you to use multiple communication methods to share that with clients. You should this week send out an email to clients about um, how to use your online store and, and how to get them uh, subscribed to auto shipments and refills so that way uh, it, it's not going to be inconvenient for them to have to leave the house and, and get out and come to your practice. Also do a lot on social media and I'm going to share some examples coming up uh, of ways that you can let people know that you do have an online store and how to utilize that. Every email reminder that you send should have a link to your online store and I do want you to turn on reminders for every item that needs to be refilled. Remember I gave you the guideline of send the reminder one month before that product is going to be empty. You also can tell people about your online store during phone conversations. So let's say that the client calls you to request a medication refill. I would make sure that you let her know that, hey, we have an online store and here's the website to go to where you can get access to that. Your on hold message. Um, I would first have your coronavirus and, and your protocols as your first message. The second message would be uh, about, hey, we have an online store and this makes it easy for us to get refills. Um, yard signs. Um, I want you to keep in mind that the client, while they're sitting in your parking lot and you're delivering care inside the hospital, they are a captive audience in your parking lot for 20 or 30 minutes. And while they're sitting there waiting, they are gonna probably be looking at a sign in front of their vehicle. And you could also promote the online store and they might even pull out their smartphone while, while you're providing care for their pet in the hospital. They might even go on their smartphone and set up their first account and place owner right now. So let me give you two examples of how to promote the online store using social media. On the left, you're going to see one um, from Craig Road Animal Hospital there in Las Vegas. They have a YouTube channel and they actually made a video of here's how you use our online store. Here's where you click. Here's how you set up your account. Here's how you do the auto shipments. And it's a quick little short video that shows people here's all the steps that you take. On the right, you'll see an example from Hilliard Veterinary Hospital in Ohio. And, you know, get delivery to your door. And there's a picture of two cute dogs there. And um, they also in their Facebook post really shared, you know, thanks for supporting our local business through this crisis. Please buy from us. And here's how it's easy for you to do that. I want you to think about offering telemedicine services. And I want to give you a, a couple of good guidelines and resources here. Um, when you are doing telemedicine, um, the guidelines from the AVMA do suggest that you need to have an established veterinarian client patient relationship. Um, just in the last few weeks, the FDA did uh, put out a notice that they are relaxing some of those prescribing guidelines and, and um, encouraging veterinarians that if they need to, um, actually prescribe after a virtual visit um, that they can, but there are a lot of strict regulations. They typically fall to your state or province. So I do want you to double check uh, what are all the telemedicine rules for your area to make sure, because there is not a federal uh, or countrywide guideline for that. When we are utilizing telemedicine, it also allows the doctor to work remotely. And a couple of examples here. So let's say that you have um, an associate veterinarian who's um, home because maybe uh, one of their family members um, has coronavirus. And, and because of that potential exposure, they also need to stay away from other people for a quarantine period. The doctor still could work safely virtually using telemedicine. Um, it could also be that the doctor, let's look into the future, um, in the future is at a veterinary conference and there's a patient that needs to be seen uh, during the seminar break, um, they can have a virtual visit and take care of that or, or even if you are on vacation. It's a way for you to stay connected. And again, you pick the time and, and date of when you're going to see that client virtually. 
it helps you provide work-life balance. Um, you know, if you have that uh, after hours emergency uh, issue where the client's not sure, you could actually use telemedicine as a pre-screening for that. Now, I will tell you who has the most appeal for telemedicine is millennials. Millennials are now the largest pet owning segment. They spend more on veterinary care than any other generation ever has. And 60% of millennials want telemedicine. So the first step is you want to look at what services you'll offer via telemedicine. And there are some obvious choices, but I will tell you that as, as you dip your toe into this, you need to be kind of crystal clear with your clients. So if I have a dog with a mild problem, something like an ear infection, it makes sense to be able to do that via telemedicine. If my dog has broken his leg, you cannot do that via telemedicine, okay? But I think you literally have to be that black and white clear with people of what we can and cannot do over telemedicine. Some areas where it does work well is follow-up exams. Um, and I have a picture of a dog here um, with, with uh, the ears being checked because I think this is an area where oftentimes clients don't come back in 10 to 14 days for that follow-up visit because they don't think it's medically necessary. So it can actually fix that low compliance for follow-up exams by utilizing telemedicine for that. I also want to encourage your team to stop saying recheck because recheck to the client from their perspective sounds free and optional. I instead want you to use the term progress exam. You also can use telemedicine for post-surgical assessments. Um, you could actually view through, through the telemedicine app or through the client's smartphone. Um, they can even take pictures or do a video for you of show me the incision site. I want to see how it's healing. Um, I also uh, have an example of a veterinarian in Texas who the client kept saying, you know, because the dog would have intermittent limping. And the client would say, well, when we come to the hospital to see you, he quits doing it. But he does it at home. And so through telemedicine, the doctor was actually able to view the dog's mobility and its gait, and they were able to assess that situation because the dog behaved completely differently when visiting the hospital. You also can use telemedicine for hospice care, that after our screening tool to see, you know, do we need to meet at the practice and, and do emergency care? And then general wellness advice. You know, a lot of times pet owners just aren't sure, do I need to have my pet seen or not? and you could utilize telemedicine as that initial screening. There also is an instance where actually physically traveling may be stressful or difficult for that pet, and it actually may deter them from getting any medical care, and certainly telemedicine is better than zero care. So when you're doing telemedicine, there's a couple of options. Um, you can do telephone or video. Um, if you have an iPhone, you, know, you can utilize FaceTime, uh, there's also uh, online services such as uh, Skype and Zoom, web-based chatting, and smartphone apps. And um, one of the links that I'm going to share with you is actually a, from the AVMA, and it's a list of all the telemedicine providers. Um, I think it's best if you can do an app because um, it has a lot of tools in it that just doing FaceTime wouldn't or, or something like Skype. Um, when you have an app, not only can you see each other, the, the doctor and the client and the patient, but it also has tools where the client can post and share pictures or videos or other attachments, and you can share those back and forth. So there's a messaging capability within a telemedicine app. Some of the apps actually integrate with your practice management software. And one of the things that I love about that AVMA list of telemedicine providers is it's a chart and it lists all the companies, and then it has columns of yes or no, does it do this or that? And it's a nice, handy side-by-side -side comparison. Now, when you do telemedicine, of course, um, it's also a revenue source for the practice. I want you to be very careful and review the rules for your state or providence around telemedicine. And I have shared um, also in the helpful links um, the AVMA and AHA Guide to Telemedicine, and it will actually give you some of those areas where you can check what are the rules in my area, what can I do and not do by telemedicine, what are the rules on veterinary client-patient relationship. You also should check with your insurance provider and confirm that 
um, telemedicine is included in your liability coverage. As a veterinary consultant, I actually advise you to charge the same fee for a telemedicine appointment that you would for an in-person appointment in your practice. And let me explain why. So let's say that you charge $60 for an exam. I would charge the same $60 for a telemedicine appointment because I want to make sure that clients are now thinking, oh, well, if it's only $40 for a telemedicine, I'll just do that instead of making an appointment. And I think it can actually deter them from in-person visits. So to keep it simple, I would just have it be the same rate. I also would encourage you um, to review that list of telemedicine providers because they have very different fee structures. Some charge you per case that you see, others are a monthly rate, others are a percentage. And so you'll wanna evaluate those as you're making that choice. Next, let's talk about what work can be done from home because I know that um, some of us may be reducing hours and, and trying also to limit the staff's exposure. So we're gonna start with the client service representatives as our first group because my goal in showing you what employees could do from home is to keep them employed, but also equally important, be generating dollars for the practice. So depending upon your phone provider, um, you may be able to actually have your receptionist answer calls and have those calls forwarded to them uh, so they can take those calls at home. Or um, I will tell you the phone service that I use um, I also have an online platform and I can do calls actually from my computer through that web-based service. So um, then I'm not even on my own um, cell phone. I could just do it actually literally through the computer. So the client care team could actually be doing scheduling of those urgent care appointments uh, from home, connecting in to the practice management software. They also can be managing and checking the daily emails that are coming in from clients just like it would during a normal business day and they were sitting there at the reception desk. They can do a lot of callbacks, contacting clients that have upcoming refills and actually prompting them to enroll and get that through the online store. I would also make sure you're calling clients that have overdue patient reminders. Um, I don't want there to be risk of exposure to rabies or heartworm disease or, or other things that could not only be expensive, but could be challenging to try and treat during this time. And I also would have them forward booking appointments for the next two months. So as we start to transition back to semi-normal operations, they can be setting up full schedules for that going forward. For the hospital managers, some of the duties they can do at home is actually set up and promote that online store. So they can be on the phone with the distributor sales professional going through all the how-tos and getting that going. You also can create online client forms. Um, I love for you to have your new client registration form as a fillable form right on your website that then has a submit button. Um, a super easy and a, a affordable option to do that is uh, jotforms.com and that will actually help you build some of those online forms for your practice right on your website. I also would have the manager be doing this daily creation of all of your social media posts and email blasts to keep your clients informed and coming up with back to normal marketing plans. You know, what are we going to do when we get back to the way things are, are have been in the past when we're seeing regular appointments? Um, we may do it slightly different, but how can we help that transition to back to normal? Also setting and managing staff schedules. Um, I uh, talked with the hospital manager who she split her team into two staffs, A and B staff, trying to keep, get every, hours for everybody, but also working within reduced hours that the practice is seeing patients. Um, this is one of my favorites, all those unfinished projects. Let me give you a couple of examples. Digitizing and making PDFs out of every handout that you have for your practice library, because now we want to send those digitally rather than passing pieces of paper. Starting a YouTube channel, um, creating web-based history forms, Updating the website, you know, are all of the employees current with pictures and bios? You can do that from home. And then just honestly be a champion of good morale. Thank people, text them, call them, you know, be a cheerleader to make sure that you're supporting the mental health of your employees. Doctors and technicians also have some tasks that they can do from home. Um, what I love for you to do, and this is very easy if you have electronic medical records, is you can actually search for your patients by diagnostic codes. 
and look to see what is their status for both um, exams and lab work for your top 10 chronic conditions. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you like to see a diabetic cat every three months for follow-up care. I would look for, in running that report in your practice management software, which diabetic cats are overdue by one to three months. And then I would actually have you call those clients because that could generate either a curbside concierge visit or a telemedicine visit. And we also can make sure that we're keeping that patient up to date on their exams and lab work. It also could generate medication refills. And then when you're talking to those clients with pets that have chronic health conditions, it also could feed your telemedicine business. So what I like for you to do is when you identify those patients that are overdue, that are, are you're trying to manage chronic health conditions, is have your client care team actually get those in for curbside concierge care. I like to use the yes or yes technique, offering two appointment choices to that client based upon your availability. And then the last one that we'll um, look at and then I'll um, answer your questions is how to use forward booking to transition to normal business operations. So I want you today to be filling your schedule one and two months out. If you are seeing an urgent care today, you want to book that follow-up care right now. So let's say it's that ear infection and you want to see it again in two weeks. Um, I would schedule that either as a concierge care visit or a telemedicine visit. And what I try and do to lead the client and increase the likelihood that they're going to say yes is schedule it with the same doctor on the same day of the week at the same time. So if it's 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and the client is here, I'm going to try and schedule it for another 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. I also want you to use the term progress exam instead of recheck. I just think it's more professional and really creates that sense of importance and urgency. So I want you to lead the client to yes, again, with that yes or yes technique. We need, not recommend, because recommend is a wiggle word, progress exam, not recheck, and then offer your next two appointment choices or a telemedicine appointment and lead the client to say yes. Should you schedule now or later? Um, I would tell you to look at booking patients that are coming due for things like rabies, which for many of you is a, a state law requirement in your area. Um, I don't want them to postpone getting rabies vaccination. ADMA actually had a statement about this recently because if there is exposure, you know that the, the consequence can be um, horrible. And I wanna make sure that, that we're also keeping those pets protected. You can forward book a month or two months out routine care that's coming up. I advise you as part of your scheduling strategy to have preventive checkups as, as you get back to normal business operations, be the first appointment of each hour, the first appointment after lunch, and then, because that kind of lets you hit the reset button and start your afternoon back on time, and then the last appointment of the day. Utilize online scheduling tools um, this is an example from my veterinarian. I can go to their website and literally fill out an online form and put in three different appointment choices that I prefer, why, reason for visit, and then I get an email back from my veterinarian confirming one of those times if they are available. When to confirm, um, I like for you to do a series of three confirmations. If it's forward booked, so we're maybe booking appointments out in May or June, I'm going to send a text or an email reminder two weeks before that appointment is coming due because if the client needs to make any changes, they can. I send another second reminder four days before and again, text or email. The last one is sent two days before that appointment and I call that client, but only if they did not reply to the electronic notification. I wanna end with some helpful resources for your practice. And um, I am recording today's webinar and we'll be sharing that on Facebook and YouTube. You'll get an email from me tomorrow with uh, where you can find those. Um, but if you're watching right now, you may wanna grab a screenshot of this or take a picture with your smartphone. Here are all of the links and they're also in the helpful web links box of where you can go for telemedicine resources, for um, coronavirus resources. Um, also for uh, Canva um, is a great resource. I use it almost daily. Um, they have all kinds of free templates that you can make graphic design posts for 
all different kinds of social media for your employee badges. Um, and, and it's just a, a really great resource. So final words of advice as we wrap up today. Um, I want to look at this pandemic as really an opportunity for you to examine how you serve clients and patients, because it is going to change from here. I want you to start some of the initiatives that we discussed today, because that's going to help you on that road to recovery. I also want to make sure you're establishing ongoing revenue streams, things like uh, preventive care plans, an online pharmacy, because that's going to help uh, really proof your business for future crisis. This is the perfect time to work on, not just in your business. So at this time, I'm going to answer our questions. Um, it looks like, and I'm going to scroll up here, we've had a couple of folks post. Um, is it impossible to compete with places um, like Chewy? Um, so if we have to decrease our medication prices. Um, I actually have um, a course I would recommend to you. Um, and you can go to my website, which is csvets.com, and then click on the store button. And it's called Quit Losing to Internet Pharmacies. And that will give you all kinds of very specific strategies. Of, and it's a whole hour class on just how you can do that. Um, our next question is you use our online store to compete with Internet Pharmacies, but you don't divert business from um, your in-house pharmacy where you see a larger profit. Um, I will tell you... Um, you need to be doing the online store. Um, some clients still want to come physically and buy from you in the clinic, and that's great. But there's also a percentage of clients, particularly millennials, who are heavy online shoppers. And I will tell you, do both, so that way you get both of those opportunities. Um, next question for multiple standalone clinics when, with same practices, we suggest one YouTube channel or separate and repeat the same videos create separate channels for separate practices. Um, I want to make sure that I see the doctors and the staff in those videos that I personally see when I go to that specific location. So I would not just throw them under one big umbrella, have it be individual. Now, as we end today, I want to share a couple of additional training opportunities for you. I do a live uh, CE class on the third Thursday of every month, the one coming up next will be on April 16th, and it will be on how to utilize technicians as physician assistants to multiply your revenue. And in that course, I'm going to teach you the types of appointments technicians and veterinary assistants can see, how to charge for those, and how to create scheduling guidelines. That is one of the links, um, and you'll see that, I believe it's the first one, in the helpful web links. And you can enroll at um, shop.csvets.com. And then last, I want to thank you for learning today. I know that, that you took some very important time out of your schedule today. And as a bonus thank you, uh, through May 15th, any training package that is purchased, I'm going to mail you a complimentary copy, and this is both U.S. and Canada, of my book on 101 communication skills for veterinary teams. And in that book, which there's 100 scripts, um, I cover telephone skills, exam room communication, difficult clients, and financial situations. So that will be a tremendous resource for you. So thanks everyone for your participation today. Stay well, stay healthy. We're all counting on you. This concludes today's training. Mm -hmm.